Well, all right, well, this morning, it is uh, the Christmas season, and we're coming into December now, and so something was on my, my heart over the last few months. I talked about end times and signs of the end times and things that were going to take place right before Jesus comes back to receive the church and the rapture takes place. Um, and we've been studying the importance of those signs and the signs of the end times. And when we read our Bible, it really should comfort us. When we read this, anybody read this anymore? Or, I mean, this is a good book. It really is. It's a good book. And we read it and we see what it says in there. It should reinforce our belief that it's true. Because what it says is being played out right in front of our eyes all the time. And we read these prophetic passages and prophetic scriptures and, and we're like, wow, this book can be trusted. You know, what it says is true and what it says is happening. And, and it's, it's accurate, you know. And so as we're entering into the Christmas season, I was thinking the same thing. You know, the decorations are going up. And everybody's going out shopping. We're even keeping folks' kids so they can go shopping here coming up and go do all the shopping. People are celebrating the holiday. And whether they even know it or not or want to acknowledge it, they're celebrating a holiday that gives honor and glory to the birth of our Lord and Savior. Amen. So even, whether you want to admit it or not, that's what you're doing. We're celebrating Christmas, the birth of our Lord and Savior. Somebody say, Hallelujah. hallelujah. And... Uh, and just like there's multitudes of passages that tell us the events of the end times of the last days, there's also a bunch of multitudes of passages that tell us about the birth of Jesus. You know, And I like reading those and I like studying them because when you talk to people about Christmas and you try to explain to them why we celebrate Christmas, well, there's, we need to give them some evidence that it's true. Right? Why do you celebrate Christmas? Oh, because Jesus was born. Well, how do you know he was blah, blah, blah. You're all even. No. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to act that out in front of you. <laughs> But there's many prophetic passages that tell us about the birth of Jesus. And so this morning I want to talk about that. I believe once again these signs are to strengthen our belief in Jesus Christ and to strengthen the, the belief we have that our Savior was born in Bethlehem over 2,000 years ago. Amen, somebody? So, uh, and and it's, a it's a perfect opportunity to talk about what I'm going to talk about today because it's Communion Sunday. And we're going to take some bread and we're going to take some wine and we're going to commemorate uh, Jesus Christ. Uh, so... The title of my message this morning, if you wanted to give it a title, is Why Bethlehem? Why Bethlehem? Why was Jesus born in Bethlehem? Anybody know? Don't, don't tell me if you won't. I mean, I'm preaching this morning. Let me preach. <laughs> and one of the main reasons that Jesus was born in Bethlehem is because it was prophesied he would be. Right? It was prophesied that he would be born in Bethlehem. And I believe this is an important fact to help prove that Jesus is the Son of God. He's not just a good prophet. He's not just another man. Jesus was born in Bethlehem just as it was prophesied that he would be born in Bethlehem. Not <coughs> There's not anybody that can fulfill all of the prophetic scriptures in this Bible like Jesus did. And one of them was being born in Bethlehem. And so we're going to start way back in the Bible. Anybody ever heard of Ruth and Naomi in the Bible? And uh, So this is uh, the passage of scripture, Ruth 1.6. Ruth 1, 6. It says, Then she arose, which is Naomi is the she, with her daughters-in-law, that she might return from the country of Moab. For she had heard in the country of Moab, while she was in Moab, she heard this about her country, how the Lord had visited his people in giving them bread. Anybody like bread? I like bread. I like it in all forms of bread. I like biscuits and cornbread and yeast rolls and... Donuts is bread too. <laughs> Donuts. I mean, that's some of the best bread. Cake. It's still bread, right? It, at the heart of it, it's still bread. Uh, we had some. Uh, we went to the um, Olive Garden the other day and had some of the garlic. Mm, so you're like, yeah, you want bread? Oh my God, bread! I mean, ain't it, I mean, there's times we've sat at the table before and just stuffed ourselves and we're full, but there was still bread. And it seemed like you can still eat bread when you can't eat anything. Bread, cinnamon rolls, oh my goodness, bread. But there was a famine in the land that had driven Naomi and her husband and her children to Moab. And while they were in Moab, though, her, son, her, her husband and her sons passed away. So now she's there all alone with her uh, daughter-in-law, two of them. And so while she's there alone with her daughter-in-laws, now she hears that, there, that God has blessed the people of, of Judah with bread. She hears the Lord has visited them by providing them bread. So basically providing them food, sustaining them, giving them life back into her home hometown, which at the time they called Bethlehem Judea. And so this is what it says in Ruth 119. 119. So they too 
went until the two of them, which is Ruth and uh, Naomi, uh, they went until they came to Bethlehem, and it came to pass when they were come to Bethlehem that all the city was moved about them, and they said, is this Naomi? But more specifically, they, uh, they went to Bethlehem because they heard there was bread in Bethlehem. Now, why wouldn't they visit Bethlehem, and why wouldn't God give Bethlehem bread? you know what the word Bethlehem means? Anybody know what Bethlehem, Biet, Clehem? It means house of bread. So it means house of bread anyway, right? So you go into a place that's called the house of bread. It was already called that, I'm assuming, and then God gives bread in the house. I mean, how fitting. There's bread in the house of bread. <laughs> now this is why I try to continue, and, and uh, you guys hear me talk about this sometime. I try to preach the word of God around here, right? God forbid you come to the house of God and not hear the word of God. A lot of times you go to churches and all you hear is speculations and opinions and societal issues. I, I don't want to do that. I want to preach the Word. I always have. I'm always going to have my Bible. I'm always going to tell you what this says, not what I think. Come on, somebody. So if you go to the house of bread, there ought to be some bread in the house. If you come to the house of God, there ought to be some Word in the house, the Word of God. And God is the God of His house, right? So... About a thousand years, this is, this is, I'm giving you time. What I'm doing this morning, I'm trying to lay some foundation for your faith to be strengthened in the fact that our Lord and Savior is really who He says He is. He was born where He said He was born. It happened exactly like the Bible said it would happen. Amen, somebody. Amen. Celebrating Christmas isn't just some uh, uh, ritual that we do just because we can do it. And we get hung up on it too many times and it's all about the trees and the gifts and not about Jesus Himself and honoring the fact that Jesus was born for us. Amen, somebody. So this is what happened about a thousand years before the birth of Jesus. God is providing bread in Bethlehem, which brings Naomi and Ruth back to Bethlehem. Remember, Naomi and Ruth were not in Bethlehem. God says, I'm going to put some bread in Bethlehem. Okay, Naomi and Ruth go back to Bethlehem, to the house of bread. And what happens there? Ruth meets a man named Boaz. And Ruth and Boaz has a son named Obed. And Obed has a son named Jesse. And Jesse has a son named David who is in the direct lineage of Jesus Christ himself. So how important was it for the bread to be in the house of God in Bethlehem? It was important enough to get Naomi and Ruth to go back so that Jesus' lineage could be established where God said it would be established. Come on, somebody. I love this stuff. I, I get a little geeked out when I get into some of the, the study. And I know some of you don't get all cut, hung up on all these numbers and things like I do. But, and I don't preach them sometimes because we uh, move on, Pastor. Give me something exciting. To me, this is exciting stuff, right? To, to be able to throw the timeline out there and say, this is what God said here, 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 and bam, it happened. You know, that's why I do believe some people, they've got, they've got their verbiage mixed up, but some people believe in the Big Bang Theory. I believe in the Big Bang Theory, too. I believe God spoke, and bang, it happened. That's, that's my big bang theory, <laughs> right? So if this is Bethlehem, and let me throw this out there as a side note. You know, also notice that this is a thousand years before Jesus was born in Bethlehem. This is the same Bethlehem that was occupied by Jewish people, Israelites back then, right? Remember, a thousand years before Jesus was born. This is the same land that the Palestinians say is their land and Israel has no right to it. And Israel's only been there since 1948. Just a... <laughs> Just want to detour just a little bit there now. Now, this is the same war you see on television right now. Free Gaza from the river to the sea. Palestinians will be free. Get Israel off of the Palestinians' land because Palestine owns rights to that land. Israel has no right to that land. I'm, I'm sorry. I've been to Israel, and every artifact you dig up over there is Jewish. For 3,000 years, they've been digging up Jewish artifacts. Don't tell me they just got there in 1948. Oh, and let me tell you, and billions, at Christmas time, billions of people will celebrate the birth of a man that happened over 10, 000, over 2,000 years ago. Over, over 2,000 years ago, Jesus was born in Bethlehem in a land that our young people today are being told that Israel has no right to. I'm like, have you lost your ever-loving mind? Uh, yes, they have. <laughs> Answer, yes, they have. <laughs> I guess I shouldn't ask the question, but have they lost? Yes, they have. They've lost their ever-loving minds. <laughs> And even think about this, there's another book in the Bible, Micah. I know some of y'all probably read Micah every day in your book. <laughs> like, Micah, that's even a book in the Bible? <laughs> yeah, there's a prophet, his name is Micah. And in Mi Micah 5.2, this is what he says. He says, but thou, Bethlehem Ephratah, though thou be little amongst the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel 
whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. Micah 5, 2, 700 years before Jesus was born, prophesied where Jesus would be born. Mm, come on, somebody. You can't even remember what you've done last week. <laughs> and God's talking a thousand years before Jesus was born. He's talking about the house of bread, Bethlehem. 700 years before Jesus was born, he's telling people, look, I've got a ruler that's coming. He's been from old. He's been from everlasting, everlasting, and he's going to be born in Bethlehem. Amen, somebody. So why Bethlehem? Because God said so. I mean, that's a, pretty good, that's a pretty good reason for me. God said so. But here, let's, look, let's see what it says in Luke 22, let's, I'm sorry, Luke 2, verses 1 through 7. Luke 2, 1 through 7. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor over Syria. And all went to be taxed, every one to his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea unto the city of David, which is called what? Bethlehem. Bethlehem. <clears throat> Why? Because he was the house and lineage of David. To be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. That means she was big pregnant. Being great with, you know, so just, I mean, it was, she was great. It was close, right? And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. So was it by accident that at this certain time Caesar decided that the whole world should be taxed? What a coincidence. Was it purely coincidence that Mary happened to be pregnant at that time and Joseph picked her up and took her to Bethlehem to pay taxes? What a coincidence. Was it purely coincidental that Jesus was born in Bethlehem in a stable placed in a manger, which we're told that that manger is basically was a feeding trough for animals? Food for the world laying in a feeding trough? Mm-mm-mm. Don't try to tell me this Bible ain't true and does, doesn't read like it reads and says what it says and, and is accurate down to every, every dot, every jot and tittle is what the Bible says. And then on one occasion, even after Jesus was already a grown man, he went to the temple one day and he caused a stir. He made a, he made a mess one day in the temple, like Jesus usually does when, he, when we went to the temple. And he did enough that people would even, they started arguing over who he was and where he come from. And one person asked this question, John 7, 42. John 7, 42. It says, Hath not the Scripture said that Christ cometh from the seed of David out of the town of Bethlehem where David was? See, even the people in those days knew enough about the Scripture to start asking questions, and their Scripture says, well, wait a minute, didn't it say that he was going to come out of Bethlehem? i got to answer for you, yes! Yes, it said he was going to come out of Bethlehem. Jesus Christ in the seed of David born in the town of Bethlehem. Oh, little town of Bethlehem. Hmm. And one day while Jesus was teaching his disciples, they said this, they're having this discussion. This is John 6, 28 through 35. <coughs> John, 20, John 6, 28 through 35. Then they said unto him, What shall we do that we might work the works of God? And Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, that you believe on him whom he has sent. You know, sometimes if you're ever wondering what you should be doing for God, first thing is just believing in Jesus. <laughs> Let's take step one. What's, what can I do to do the works of God? Believe on Jesus. Put your faith in Jesus. Trust Jesus. And then said, Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God, that you believe on him who he was sent. And they said, Therefore unto him, What sign showest thou then, that we may see and believe? What dost thou work? You know, a lot of times, those, those people are no different than us. There's a lot of people looking for signs today still. Show us a sign. Show us a sign. Then we'll believe. Do you know that even when they saw the signs, they didn't believe? No different than today. When people see signs, they're like, Yeah, well, yeah, I don't know. Show me another one. Do another trick for me. Yeah, okay. So, and this is what they said. Our fathers did eat man in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. And then Jesus said to them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven. See, they, they were giving Moses credit for the manna that was coming down from heaven, the bread that was feeding them at the time. And Jesus like, No, Moses did not make that happen. You know, let me tell you who made it happen. He said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Then said they unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. And Jesus said unto them, what did he say? 
I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. He that believeth on me shall never thirst. You know, when I was growing up, I loved them. Anybody ever have those little dot-to-dot -dot pictures? Anybody, anybody remember the dot-to-dots? You know, I've never been real artistic. That was easy. I mean, some of y'all guys could draw. I mean, I, barely, I can't even draw flies. I mean, it just, I mean, I just barely do it. I mean, I'm not, not that artistic. I, I mean, I can draw a few things, little bitty stuff, look like some childish stuff. But those dot-to-dots were easy. You just follow the dots, right? And I love them. They were, they were because they were easy. And I think the Bible is like a dot-to-dot. -dot. I think it's like one of those dot-to-dot -dot pictures, right? If we follow the Scriptures, we see God working all through history like one of those little dot-to-dot -dot pictures, forming and shaping pictures right out of His Word. Right? I, be I believe that's the way God works, if we'll just read it and understand it. So here, let let's follow the dots. A place in Judea called Bethlehem that God visits with bread. And Naomi and Ruth go back, and Ruth marries Boaz. They have Obed, Father Jesse, Father David, descendant of Jesus. Micah prophesies Jesus will be born in Bethlehem. Caesar taxes the whole world. Joseph and Mary must go to Bethlehem to be taxed. Jesus, born in a manger, placed in a feeding trough. Jesus tells his disciples God gave them the true bread from heaven. And then Jesus says, I am that bread. I'm the true bread. And what are we doing this morning? We are partaking of the bread in communion this morning. That's like a big dot to dot. God's like, I'm going to start here, but I'm going to show you the proof. I'm going to show you the signs. I'm trying to get you from point A to point B and encourage your faith and get you to really believe what I'm saying. Amen, Amen somebody. Amen. There's too many people doubting the Word of God today because they're not connecting the dots. <laughs> Just connect the dots. I promise you, your faith will get stronger. Quit skipping dots. <laughs> so why Bethlehem? Bethlehem is because of Jesus. Bethlehem is because the life, the light, and the bread for the whole world was born in a place called House of Bread so that we all could partake and have that life from Jesus that would sustain all of us throughout eternity. That's why Bethlehem. Amen, somebody? Amen. See, God had a plan. Why? Because God always has a plan. Because God always has a plan. And I feel the same way about me and you today. He done all that he done, not just for, the, for them in that era, that generation, that time. He done it for us today, too. God has made us promises. He's told us that he will cause the promises to come to pass in our own lives. And what we sometimes look like and we say, well, maybe it's just coincidence. Maybe it's just God putting the pieces in place. Maybe the things that we're looking at and we're wondering, why isn't this working? Why isn't God doing this? I think, what if God's on the, uh, on, on, the, on the outside or around us somehow just putting dots together, waiting for you to connect them? What if the things that we're facing, God is working all the time, every day, to make something happen good for our lives. We're just not connecting the dots. Come on, somebody. You know, it's, it's funny when I hear people say, sometimes they'll say, well, something told me. Like, really? Something's talking to you? Stop and find out what it is. <laughs> if you're hearing voices. <laughs> I, believe, I believe we all are. I just, know that, I just know where the voices are coming from. They're mine. They're God's. They're the enemies. They're my conscience. Right? So I, I, if something told you, but that's the funny thing. Well, I've I done this because something told me. I can't believe it worked out because something told me to do it that way. Like, really? How about just thank God <laughs> that he told you and you move forward, right? So what may seem like inactivity from God? You know, a lot of folks say, well, God's not doing it. He's inactive. What if he's behind the scenes? What if he's behind the scenes making and preparing Bethlehem for you? What if our lives are just like what he says in the Bible? I, this, is, this is my thought. I believe our, li our lives are just like those dot-to-dot -dot pictures sometimes. Problem is, we want to see all the dots before we make a move. Problem is, we want to go from dot to dot and God give us every dot before we move. What if God says, that's not faith? What if I've asked you to do this or I've asked you to do that and I'm expecting you to move and as you move, you'll connect the dots. But if you do nothing, guess what? You won't see the next dot. <laughs> I'm going to keep talking about dot to dots. I'm going to go buy me some dot to dots. <laughs> see, the problem is, God, He just doesn't seem to let us see all the dots at the same time. He wants us to step out in faith and walk in faith. And this is what I know that, trust me, this is what I believe in my heart. If God, through a thousand years of preparation, can get a baby to be born in a manger when he says it will be born, I don't think your issue is too big for him. 
I don't think whatever you're facing, I don't think whatever's going to happen this Christmas, I don't think whatever's going to happen after the first of the year, I don't know where your life is, I don't know what you're thinking, I don't know what your emotions are, I don't know where you're at mentally, I don't know where you're at emotionally, but I can guarantee you that my God that can make a way for a child to be born in a manger a thousand years after the place was prepared to get them there at that time, at that moment, at that day. Come on, somebody. I don't think your situation is too big for God. Amen, somebody. And then, and then you got these wise men. I don't care if they were astrologers or whatever they were. People say, well, these were astrologers. I don't care. God was talking to them and says, go, and you'll find this child. And when you get there, bring him gifts. And you know when they got there, he was there? I mean, go figure. God says, go, and the child will be there. They went, and shazam! (laughs) He was there. Can you believe it? (laughs) I love love putting the Old Testament prophecies. I love putting the New Testament prophecies. I love putting the historical evidence together and letting the Bible tell me how true it really is and how accurate it really is. So in this, this Christmas, when you're talking about Jesus and you're talking about celebrating Christmas, remember, this ain't just happenstance. This is not coincidence. This is not, well, whew, I don't know how God worked that out. I don't know how he worked it out either, but he did, and it's true. And it's written in the Bible. This is what I, th- I love about God. God was not afraid to put down what he done so we can read it and actually go back and fact check him. <laughs> A lot of fact checkers out there today, right? Problem was... There, until the facts started getting out, people wasn't worried about fact-checking so much. Now they don't like the facts. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> so all I'm saying is these are the facts. Jesus, born in a manger in Bethlehem, the bread of the world. He even says it. I'm the bread that come down from heaven. The bread come down from heaven, placed in a feeding trough for all humanity per- to partake of. And this morning in our communion, we get to partake of the bread and the wine to commemorate the body and the life of Jesus Christ. (laughs) We're just another dot along the way to the portrait God is making. Amen, somebody. Well, that's all i got to preach about that. I want to take communion. I want to get on the bread. (laughs) So if y'all would stand to your feet this morning, and let's come down front and uh, 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 avail yourself to the sacraments. In Matthew... 26 verse 26 it says as they were eating bread Jesus took bread blessed and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said take eat and this is my body let's partake of the bread and then he took the cup and he gave thanks and he gave it to them saying drink from it all of you for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Let's partake of the cup. And Father, this morning we thank you for the bread. We thank you for the, for the wine, the juice. The bread, your body. The juice representing the blood. The bread that came down from heaven. A body that was prepared for us to sacrifice for our sins so that we wouldn't have to die in our sins. We commemorate that today, Father, by honoring Jesus in the, in the sacraments. We thank you for the body. We thank you for the bruises. We thank you for the, the stripes on the back. We thank you for the piercings. We thank you that we're celebrating Christmas and the, the, <clears throat> the birth of Jesus, but... What an honor that Jesus knew that he was, he was being born to live, but he was also being born to sacrifice his life. And we thank you for that, Father. What an, what an awesome responsibility to know and trust and believe that our Savior, born on Christmas Day, that we celebrate, was also the Savior born to die for our sins. And that the wine represents that blood being shed. Because you said without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. 
So our Savior, our Lord Jesus, was willing to shed His own blood, to, to spill His own blood, because there's life in the blood. And He knew by shedding His blood, He could forgive us of our sins. He could eradicate, not just cover, but eradicate, remove our sins because of shedding His own blood. Our sacrifice, our scapegoat, our penalty for sin. So Father, this Christmas, let us not forget that we're celebrating the birth of Jesus, but the birth of Jesus was just a prelude to the death of Jesus. When we hold it high, we honor it. Father, we respect it. And we give you honor, we give you glory. We thank you for it, Father. We thank you that you've brought the world the bread of life, that whoever eats this bread will not die, but live forever in the kingdom of God. We thank you for that today, Father. And we do it in Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. 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 Y'all give the Lord a hand clap of praise this morning. Man, that might be that might be the shortest message I've ever preached at Open Arms Church. Uh, can you stand to your feet, please? Could I have the healing team come over, please? The healing team and then our uh, prayer agreement team <clears throat> and our prophetic deliverance team. So after service, if you need prayer this morning, please do not hesitate to come forward, avail yourself to, to the prayer. Amen, amen. The Bible said believers will lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. That's right, so they, they shall. Another biblical promise. That's it. These are things that... As I say, if we put the dots together, we've, it's been proven over and over again the Word of God is true. And if it says believers will lay hands on the sick and they shall recover, don't argue with God. Amen. Come receive prayer. Amen? Amen? He also says to agree is touching anything. anything. To agree, agreement in prayer. Um, I don't know about you guys, but we get enough disagreement. <laughs> I get enough disagreement in my life. There's times I'd like to have some agreement. And if you need prayer this morning and you'd like someone to agree with you in prayer... Come receive some prayer this morning. Amen? Uh, and the deliverance team, in or out, when in doubt. There's so many people still argue about what deliverance is, what deliverance isn't. Look, if you're being pestered by uh, the spirit realm and you feel like you're being influenced and you're being attacked, who cares where it's coming from, in, out, who cares? Go receive prayer. Amen. Don't argue theologically, phys- phys- uh, psych- psychologically. <laughs> What's some other words? Some other ology words. Don't argue about it. Just go get prayer. Amen? I don't know about you. Freedom is freedom. However, right? So receive freedom this morning. Amen? Thank you guys so much for being here today. Um, just thank you. God is good. Amen? And he's, he's worthy to be praised. His word is true. He is faithful. Amen? Father, we thank you this morning. We give you honor. We give you glory for, for providing salvation through Jesus Christ. But not only providing salvation, but also giving us the road map, the signs, a, a way for us to prove that it was real. You've given us evidence beyond argument that what you've said is true. So we receive Jesus this morning more fully than we ever have because we know it's true. Our hearts know it's true. Our minds know it's true. And most of all, our spirits know it's true. So God, I thank you this this morning for your grace, your mercy on all of us. And we thank you for these things in Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. Amen and amen. You guys be blessed.